Today's episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. If you have watched any of my videos, you are probably at least a little interested in documentary type content. Well, guess what? Check out Curiosity Stream, a streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles on pretty much every subject you can imagine. Love cute animals? They've got that. Want to learn more about quantum physics? Got you covered. Anything from the worlds of science, history, society, and more. Check out their many historical documentaries like Frank Sinatra or America's Golden Age about the life and times of the pop music legend. Best thing, it's just $2.99 a month. And for you guys, you'll get 26% off an annual subscription plus complimentary access to Nebula if you use promo code curiositystream.com slash Todd in the Shadows at sign up. So click the link in the description and check them out now. Thank you and on with the show. Welcome to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. Where again, we have to ask, what is a hit exactly? In the early 80s, as punk became new wave, the underground clubs were all dancing to a snotty band from Ohio called The Waitresses. They knew what boys liked, they knew what guys wanted. What they wanted was The Waitresses. Boys like me. What girls liked and wanted remained a mystery, at least until Good Charlotte came along. Girls don't like boys, girls like cards and money. Hmm. Yes, thank you, Good Charlotte. So that covers both ends of the entire spectrum of human desire. But are the waitresses a one-hit wonder at all? That's iffy to say. I mean, they are according to several books of one-hit wonders I have where I get all my ideas. And the song was their only song to chart. It just didn't chart very high. That's probably not enough to call it a hit, except that it was such a fucking earworm that it's just lingered around for a pretty decent amount of time. I know what boys like. I know what guys want. I see them looking. Hmm, yes, thank you, Glee. But that's not the only complicating factor. The waitresses are a very weird case of one-hit wonderdom, because they're a one-hit wonder whose one hit has changed, kind of? In fact, it should be well after Thanksgiving by the time I upload this, so you should be hearing the waitresses quite a bit right around now. To be honest, I'm a little confused about how to handle this one. This is the rare one-hit wonder where people actually seem to disagree what their one hit actually is. Or as band leader Chris Butler put it, they were a one-hit wonder with two half hits. Okay, well officially this is a review of the song that actually charted, with its perfectly of the moment video and its snarky sassy attitude. But I promise you we will also talk about the holiday tune which has seemed to dwarf their actual hit in hindsight. So, how did the waitresses so thoroughly know what boys liked, yet not be liked enough to be the next killer band of the 80s? Let's find out. Sucker. <laughs> I know what boys like. Okay, so it's hard to tell where the next underground music scene is going to develop out of. Often, it's in the big cities like New York. Sometimes they sprout out of little college towns like Chapel Hill. So, it's not entirely crazy that some record executives thought the next big focal point of music was going to be Akron, Ohio. The big underground sensation from Akron was Debo. This is not Debo. This is one of a small number of local bands signed in Debo's wake, Tin Huey. They did a pretty ripping cover of I'm a Believer and a bunch of other things that were a lot weirder and less commercial and which doomed them to an early death after one album. But for a while, they were still potentially the next big thing. And during that time, their guitarist, Chris Butler, which I think is this guy over here maybe, he came up with an idea for a song. I know what boys like. I know what guys want. The only problem was that it was written for a woman. So a college friend of his, Patty Donahue, volunteered to sing it. And during shows, the guys would say, Hey, we're no longer Tin Huey for this one song. We're now The Waitresses. And they'd put on shirts that say the waitresses and Patty would come up and sing the couple waitress songs they had. And when Tin Huey went kaput, 
Chris moved to New York and tried shopping around his waitress demos, and when he finally got a bite, he was like, Yeah, the waitresses, we're totally a real band! And then he bought a bus ticket to New York for Patty and slapped together the rest of the band from scratch. Including Billy Fika, the drummer from the legendary CBGB's band Television? Wow. So by 1981, their single, I Know What Boys Like, was already being played in the punk clubs, and they were out on tour trying to make it into a real hit, and then their record label asked them to record something for a Christmas album. Which, as Butler will tell you, does not make any sense. They were on ZE Records, which was an experimental indie label full of avant-garde art-funk weirdos. Boy, I can't wait to hear a holly jolly Christmas carol from the band Suicide. But it's generally a good idea to do what your boss asks you to, so he was like, uh, yeah, I'll throw something together. In 1981, ZE Records releases A Christmas Record, one of the stranger Christmas albums you will ever hear. I actually liked it quite a lot. Here's the one by Suicide. Hello. Thank you. That's exactly what I expected a Christmas song by Suicide to sound like. Much of the album sounds like this. So, really, the waitresses were kind of the odd ones out in that their song, Christmas Rapping, actually sounded Christmassy. Adulthood has kind of sucked most of the fun out of Christmas for me. The second I even see a Santa hat, I think obligations, shopping, gifts, travel, money, stress. Ugh. So there's probably no Christmas song I truly enjoy anymore, which is a shame, especially in this case, because Christmas rapping objectively slaps. It is a true modern classic. It's got a killer intro guitar riff, some nice funky bass, and a truly awesome horn part. Butler admits he threw it together out of scraps of unfinished songs he had lying around, which is very surprising to me because all the riffs already sound very Christmassy to me. It all sounds like rock versions of Christmas carols you already know, but nothing you can quite place. Like all great Christmas pop culture artifacts, Christmas rapping feels like it's always existed. It was supposed to be a toss-off favor to our label, and who knew? Butler himself says he was amazed how good it came out. It was just supposed to be a half-ass piece of holiday-themed filler created completely out of obligation, much like this video you are watching now. Merry Christmas from Todd in the Shadows, everyone. I'm not sure why it's called Christmas Rapping. Curtis Blow already had a song called Christmas Rappin', so I guess you can also call this rapping, kind of, sort of? It just kind of flows off the cuff, like it's a story being ad-libbed right at the moment. If I have to listen to any Christmas song, it would easily be this. It's just a very happy, holly jolly song, but it's also one of the few Christmas songs that acknowledges how stressful everything is. Christmas rapping is about a girl who just wants to finish her obligations and have a nice, relaxing Christmas alone. And there's also a running thread in there about a year's worth of misconnections with this guy she met one time. And then when she pops into the grocery store to get some last minute cranberries, she finally runs into her guy, guy and has a Merry Christmas after all. It's, it's very reassuring to me, honestly. It's a story about how all the stress of the holidays will be worth it in the end. My girlfriend at the time said, oh man, you are all over the radio. And I thought, finally, that stupid I Know What Boys Like song, after months of plugging it, must have broken through. And she said, no, it's your Christmas song. It actually wasn't that big a hit. It charted in the UK the next year, which was nice, and it hit a bunch of the bigger cities, which gave them a boost on their tour. But it wasn't like this huge immediate smash, like All I Want For Christmas Is You or anything like that. And besides, it's not like you can build a career out of Christmas music either. Butler had his one song that he really believed in, and he was going to make it a hit. The early Waitress demos actually were kind of experimental. But the band quickly became something more accessible, and they didn't really fit with the oddballs of ZE Records anymore, so it made more sense when they jumped to a bigger label. They fit them up with some more promotion, a cool stylish video, and at last the song that Chris Butler thought was a sure hit took off. Kind of. One, two, three, four. I know what boys like. 
I Know What Boys Like is, on first listen, barely a song. It sounds like they tried intentionally to do their first take as half-assedly as possible, and then intentionally didn't do a second take because that would also be too much effort. It sounds like a joke at first. But a lot of the greatest songs in rock history are like that. The laziness kind of draws you in. By the time you hit the sax solo, you'll realize that there actually was a lot of effort put into capturing that tight groove. But for the first 30 seconds, you have to be like, seriously, this can't be for real. Now when you say new wave nowadays, the first thing people think of is synthesizers. But in the early 80s, it just meant anything that wasn't abrasive or sloppy enough to be punk, but clearly wasn't that slick corporate rock either. One of the first bands to get that label was Blondie, who started as a punk band at the beginning, but also quickly went in a lot of fun new directions. The Waitresses got compared to Blondie a lot. But in some ways, I feel like they were somehow kind of more punk than Blondie. Debbie Harry exuded coolness from her pores, but it was a very glamorous kind of cool. She didn't wake up like this. I know what boys like. But Patty just sounds so perfectly effortless, just bored of all your bullshit above everything. She's not really a vocalist exactly, but she's a hell of a presence. So yeah, I love how she sings these lyrics. The lyrics themselves, that's complicated. I see them looking. Like, we've got a lot of songs these days about being hot and sexy and attractive. That's fine, but there's tons of songs like that. I got my cat moves. If that's all I Know What Boys Like was about, that'd be one thing. But it goes a lot further. They want to touch me. I never let them. It's mostly about toying with boys and their stupid emotions. I laugh right at them. Like, I don't want to use the word tease. That's a, you know, it's a very ugly, outdated concept. I make them want me. I like to tease them. But there's not really another word for it. And the fact that this is sung by a woman, but written by a dude... Zip boots and buttons. Fun to frustrate them. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a minefield. She your special baby. I don't even know if the word cock tease makes any sense anymore. Actually, why don't we do a quick primer on this? Things are very different now, but for boomers and Gen Xers, there was an intense double standard for girls. Good girls did not have sex. And if you had sex a single time, you'd get a bad reputation. But if you didn't have sex, you'd get called a tease. You led these guys on and then let them down, you heartless bitch. I think we're done with all of that now since all you kids are sharing nude photos of each other on your Insta snaps or whatever the fuck, grumble, grumble, grumble. At the very least, it's a lot better now, and that's because of a big push over the decades and slut-shaming, reclaim that word, make it into something positive. It's a lot harder to make tease positive, though. Zip boots and buttons, fun to frustrate them. The tease, a girl who tempts guys and then leaves them hanging just to be cruel. It's hard to put a positive spin on that because, one, it's not a real thing. If a girl doesn't let you hit it, it probably wasn't because they were trying to hurt you personally. And two, if they were, that'd be a pretty callous thing to do. So, naturally, this song isn't even trying to be positive, it's actively malevolent. If you really wanted to, I think you could make the case that this is a misogynist song. It's from the point of view of a female character, as written by a guy, and she's a sadistic torturer of men. On the other hand, you could also say that it's very empowering to women, because she's a sadistic torturer of men. I mean, come on, right? For guys, there is the proud tradition of the Heartbreaker song. I kiss them and I love them, cause to me they're all the same. No, I'm a ladies' man. I love them and leave them. It's a, you know, that's a very anti-hero kind of song. So girls need their own version. And because it's the early 80s, a girl can only be a heartbreaker by not having sex. So the song's like, I string them along for fun because it amuses me. They get so angry, like pouty children. Deny the candy, I laugh right at them. Again, this was definitely written by a man. Having a bunch of horny, lovesick dudes following you around does not seem like very much fun to me. It sounds like it'd get tedious very quickly. Okay, you know what boys like, but why do you like this? What are you getting out of it? I know what boys like. Man, Patty just sells it. Butler was always quick to say that she's not my puppet or my mouthpiece. She's her own person. And Patty was like, yeah, it's my performance. It's my experiences I bring to it. And I just totally buy it from her. 
It's a total power fantasy of a song. And you listen to this, and you absolutely think that she holds all the cards. She's hot, you want her, and she doesn't want a thing from you. It is completely badass. She can squash any of these guys like bugs. Sorry, I teach you. <laughs> well, that's just mean. I'm not saying I love this song. I'm not even sure I like this song. It's catchy in kind of the wrong ways. It's a little annoying. <laughs> yeah, this part is probably a mistake. The song lives and dies off of Patty's flat affect and killer attitude, and it only goes so far. I feel safe in saying that this song overplays its one trick. I'm not sure this is something I'd ever willingly choose to listen to. But whether or not I like this song, I respect this song. I completely get why Butler had so much faith in its success. And what a success it was. It made it all the way up to number 62. Not even in the top 40. That's not enough to sustain a career. I feel sad now. Butler says that at this point he realized that he was now basically a screenwriter for a really good actress. So maybe he should try a little harder and write something better for her than just her being a bitch for no reason. So he actually started talking to all the women he knew about their lives, trying to come up with ideas. I think that's where Christmas rapping came out of, and he brought that to the rest of the album. I actually think it came out pretty well. This is their follow-up single, No Guilt. It's kind of a breakup song, but it's also about the joy of what we now call adulting. I call the llama when the water turns brown. Did you know I own some valuable records? I learned a lot since you've been gone. Like she's telling this ex, you know, I guess I don't need you around. I'm a young single gal in the city. I'm handling my shit and living my life. Sorry, but I don't feel awful. It wasn't the end of the world. Have a weakness for second wave ska, so I like this song a lot. But I will admit that there's not really much of a hook on it either. It's not really much of a single, I'm not surprised it didn't get big. And having now listened to the album, I think it's actually pretty good. I like the title track, Wasn't Tomorrow Wonderful, a lot too. Uh, yeah, I'd recommend it. But none of it is like an immediate attention getter the way I know what Boys Like was. They picked up a decent cult following off the album, but it wasn't really enough to keep them going. They put out a second album. It basically tanked. Their only real traction after the first hit was doing the theme song to Square Pegs, a fondly remembered but short-lived show about nerdy high school girls. Yes, that is the young Sarah Jessica Parker. After that, Butler admits that he and Patty didn't really get along, especially not after the misery of being a touring musician, and after just a couple years, the band fell apart and they never reunited. Well, you know, they all went their separate ways. Their sax player, Mars Williams, joined the Psychedelic Furs. Their bass player, Tracy Wormworth, turned out to have a pretty long career as a side woman. She played the B-52s and Sting. Chris kept recording, he did some producing, mostly he went back to his avant-garde work. Patty moved behind the scenes as an A&R rep until she tragically died of cancer at age 40 in 1996. Sadly, I don't think she lived to see how Christmas rapping kept slowly going from a one-off novelty into one of the more beloved Christmas songs of the last 40 years. I knew it from an old Dr. Demento comedy CD, but it's certainly not a novelty anymore. In 1998, both Save Ferris and the Spice Girls covered it, and I think that was the tipping point, because since then, everyone has had a go at it. The Donnas, Kylie Minogue, Belle and Sebastian, of course fucking Glee again. I know what Boys Like is at least a worthy song, but Christmas Rapping is a great song. Yes! I know what boys like. The waitresses were unique, I guess. They were doing something no one else was doing. They were a hip, new wave band for the ordinary gal. 
They wrote one really great holiday song and one unforgettably confident new wave single, and their back catalog is better than you'd expect. They know what Todd likes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah.